for having me. Thank you, Leslie, for the introduction. As she said, my name is Katherine Berkland, and I hail from the Beacon School of Business in the Economics Department. So I am going to talk to you today uh, a bit about economics and strip clubs. Uh, I may have oversold my topic just a bit today, uh, but I think that a little bit of sensationalism is probably worth it for this topic. And <laughs> given the current state of news, sensationalism seems to sell. So um, rather than uh, Strip clubs are good for the neighborhood. Let's say strip clubs are not bad for the neighborhood. Uh, so a, a little bit of a weaker statement there. As I mentioned, I am in the economics department at the Beacon School of Business. And in economics, we talk about trade-offs. So uh, my discussion and my uh, research uh, that I've been reading on strip clubs has to do with sort of this idea of trade-offs and uh, limiting the uh, existence of strip clubs and where they operate. So uh, economics is the study of trade-offs. And again, not take-offs, it's just trade-offs which is my bad pun for my strip club talk. Thank you all for listening. Uh, so when we talk about uh, trade-offs in economics, um, we're talking about the choices that people make. Here we're referring to the zoning choices. So I'm going to talk about where strip clubs locate and, and the, the reason why they might be uh, prohibited from locating in some places. So when I talk about strip clubs, the, the point that relates to economics here and by all means, uh, I'm only going to talk about economics, but there may be you have moral concerns about where strip clubs should operate or if they should operate. By all means, those are valid. Um, I'm not going to be able to address them as an economist. So as an economist, we're just going to talk about trade-offs today, and specifically the First Amendment. So when we talk about the strip clubs, uh, strip clubs are protected under the First Amendment. Nudity and nude dancing is protected as a, a, a method of free speech. Uh, so under the First Amendment, we can't prohibit that. We can't restrict it unless we have a secondary effect. So the Supreme Court of the United States has uh, ruled uh, no less than four times that there are what are called secondary effects from strip clubs. And the case that is most often made is that secondary effects are reductions in property tax values. So the claim is that when a strip club locates, property values go down. Uh, the claim is also made that crime rates go up. The same claims are made for um, locations near registered sex offenders or uh, companies that emit toxic chemicals or meth labs. All of those have what we call secondary effects. Yes, I just compared strip clubs and meth labs. Yeah, it's a good Wednesday. So when we talk about secondary effects in econ speak, we call those negative externalities. These are uncompensated impacts on bystanders. So people who are not involved in the transaction People who did not pick for the strip club to, to locate there, people who did not attend the strip club, simply are being harmed because of the existence of the strip club. So the claim is that zoning officials, municipalities, can limit where the strip clubs operate. So we can keep them out of a town, we could keep them in a part of town, or we could make them spread out across town um, based on those secondary effects. So what does Econ have to add to that? Well. In the Supreme Court rulings and in the justifications at many levels of the judiciary system, secondary effects are used to justify uh, limiting strip clubs in town, but we haven't actually measured them. So if I said to you, um, if a strip club is going to locate in your neighborhood, what's going to happen to your property values? You will all tell me that property values are going to go down. We know property values are going to go down. But do we really know that property values are going to go down? because we haven't actually quantified the property values will go down. So how would we do that? How would we look at whether property values go down when the strip club is there? If the strip club's just there, and the property is just there, you can't move the house. You can't be like, this house in this neighborhood is the same as this house in the other neighborhood, because it turns out those neighborhoods are different. So how do we do that? Well, if strip clubs cause property values to go down, we need there to be a connection. So when a strip club opens or closes, property values have to change. We need the strip club to be open or closed before we see the change in the property value. And we need to say that it's not something else that's causing the change in the property value and the change in the strip club at the same time. So if we're gonna, we're gonna talk about causation, we're gonna see whether there's a connection there. X has to happen before Y, X and Y have to be correlated, and it can't be Z. So how do we do that? Well, a unique experiment in Seattle, Washington. In 1988, Seattle, Washington imposed a one-year moratorium on the opening of new strip clubs. That moratorium was continually re-instituted uh, every year for the next 17 years. So for 18 years, Seattle had a ban on new strip clubs. You could not open a new strip club in Seattle for 18 years. Judge declared that illegal in 2005. In 2006, the city council attempted to pass some new regulations because they were worried, of course, that all these strip clubs were going to start opening. Um, the referendum was struck down by a vote. 
So by 2007, you could now open a new strip club in Seattle, Washington. So we have a unique data set that says, well, we know exactly when they open. We have property tax values, or property um, sale values before the change. We have property sale values after the change. And it happened in multiple neighborhoods. So we have a way to get data on all of the characteristics for the property values. We can see the number of um, bedrooms, number of bathrooms, whether it has a view of Mount Rainier. We can see all of this information about the property. We can tell which ones are within 500 feet, which ones are about 1,000 feet, which ones are within 2,000 feet. And so we can see if being really close to a strip club is actually really detrimental to the sale price of your property value. So if the strip club opens, your property value should go down. If it's true that strip clubs cause a decrease in property values, when the new one opens, your, your property value should go down. Accounting for everything else, so holding everything else constant, which I can do, so lots of data to be able to do that. What do you suppose we found? No effect. Strip club opens, no change in the property value. 12 months before, 12 months after, same impact. There's no, you don't see any change in the property value as a result of the strip club opening. If it's the case that strip clubs cause property values to go down, when a strip club closes, we should see property values go up. When the strip clubs closed, there were um, 13 of them in the sample. When they closed, property values went down. Oh, that wasn't the way it was supposed to go. So when we talk about this justification that we are going to limit the free speech, we're going to limit the First Amendment rights of what happens in the strip clubs, and we base it on these secondary effects or negative externalities that property rights, or that property prices are going to go down. It doesn't really hold water. We have every justification to put in those zoning laws based on moral grounds. We can have all sorts of discussion based on that. But if we're going to make the claim that adding strip clubs to the town makes the neighborhood values go, property values go down, it doesn't really hold water. I don't have any final jokes to end with, except I want to make some sort of like zing. I need a zinger. <laughs> keep your pants on. Keep your pants on. Strip clubs aren't that bad. Um, so, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. Uh, if you have questions, I'll stay.